Okay, and now uh, today we move, uh, basically we move into the 20th century. Um, uh, and there is a lot of similarity between the three authors we will be discussing, uh, uh, Nietzsche, uh, Freud, um, and uh, uh, Max Weber. Um, uh, you know, a Durkheim will be a somewhat different kind of story. Uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, Nietzsche, of course, died in 1900, but he was out of action for 10 years uh, because of mental illness, very severe mental illness. He published all of his work in the 19th century. Um, uh, Freud and uh, uh, Weber started to publish in the 19th century. But these three characters, in many ways, uh, are very important bridges uh, towards uh, 20th century social theory. Um, in a way, uh, they uh, did foreshadow uh, uh, a great deal of theorizing, particularly during the second half uh, of the 20th century, especially in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, uh, I think it's also very easy to say the point of departure um, uh, uh, from Marx. Uh, some continuity, but basic point of departure from Marx in the work of Nietzsche, um, uh, Freud, um, and uh, Weber. Um, uh, if I can put it very simply, uh, the major uh, departure is uh, uh, that they all uh, uh, depart from Marx's uh, economic reductionism, right? Uh, the emphasis on economic interest, which is actually not only Marx, right? It was uh, common uh, uh, in Adam Smith and Marx uh, as, uh, as well. They depart from this and uh, uh, they uh, um, emphasize uh, that the problem in modernity is not so much uh, in the economic system, uh, it is much more uh, in terms of um, uh, power and consciousness. Uh, the problem of modernity is uh, repression uh, in one way or another. Um, uh, the, the problem of modern life is uh, uh, that we internalize uh, the reasons for our own subjugation um, as such. Um, and somehow he, we have to figure out how to liberate ourselves from this internalized uh, subjugation. Um, why do we obey orders? Uh, uh, why do we uh, actually accept that we are subjugated? This is the central question. Um, I think uh, Nietzsche, Freud, um, and Weber are posing. Um, uh, it's again a question which has not been really asked uh, uh, by uh, um, uh, the other theorists we discussed so far. They just uh, um, had, uh, uh, you know, civil so society as a point of reference for uh, the good society. Uh, now the problem uh, for Nietzsche, Freud, uh, and Weber is in us, internally, in us, how, how, how we solve the problem uh, within ourselves. So you know, this is a kind of uh, introducing the three authors. Uh, in some ways, uh, one can say Nietzsche, Freud, uh, um, and uh, Weber uh, not only foreshadows uh, 20th century social theory, but in some ways they are the first of postmodern theorists. Right, the, the, the theorist which uh, beginning to come to terms with uh, uh, the um, uh, um, oppressive nature of modernity and try to figure out how to, uh, how to transcend that. Uh, um, uh, now, um, I think what I ask you to read for today is probably the most difficult text uh, uh, for the semester, the genealogy of morals. Uh, and you may have been greatly frustrated by it and probably also irritated by it because he's a very provocative mind. Um, uh, I hope you did what I suggested, namely you had a cursory reading of the text before today. And now you can go back to the text after my um, uh, lecture notes. Uh, and I think that should, be it should help you to find your way out 
and to see what he is uh, uh, really up to. Now, what is he up to? Let me just foreshadow before I get into his life and work, and particularly in genealogy of morals. There is another point in which uh, um, uh, uh, Nietzsche, Freud, uh, and Weber can be understood uh, um, uh, in relationship to uh, Marx. Uh, in my very introductory comments, I emphasize the difference, right? The shift away from the economy to the question of power and domination. Uh, but there is a, a, a point in which there is a continuity between them and Marx, um, uh, Nietzsche, Freud, and uh, to mainly Weber. I mean, Weber is a somewhat more complicated story, but certainly Nietzsche and Freud are critical theorists. Critical theorists in the sense as we defined this earlier, right? Critical theorists that they are offering a criticism of human consciousness. What is in our mind and how did it get into our mind? And how, uh, you know, and the problem of our consciousness in relationship to our existence. Or ex and this is very much critical theory as it was defined by Hegel and then the young Marx, the Hegelian Marx, the, uh, the Marx of Paris, uh, Paris manuscripts, right? Uh, the Marx of, um, of alienation, right? Um, and this is very, very much coming from this tradition. And the central issue is how can we subject this to, to critical scrutiny. And uh, in Nietzsche's case, uh, uh, there is an incredible attempt being made here to try to offer a critical theory which does not really have a, a critical vantage point, right? All critical theories um, of Hegel and Marx and 20th century critical theory do have an idea of a good society, of an emancipated human existence, and they criticize uh, the reality, uh, the society, what they are analyzing, from the point of view of this critical vantage point. Nietzsche is different. Uh, he is really the most radical of critical theorists, and in the 20th century, the theorist which builds the most consistently on it um, is Michel Foucault, right? To try to create, right, a theory which is critical of existence and our consciousness, but critical without telling you what is good, right? What you should be aspiring for. And that's exactly what um, uh, Nietzsche is trying to do. It is sort of the squaring of the circle. Can you be critical of a situation if you cannot tell what is the good outcome, right? Can you actually subject the very notion of the good society, the good, to critical scrutiny? This is what he's trying to do, right? To offer such a theory. Uh, well, uh, Freud is different, right? Freud is a critical theorist beyond uh, um, uh, Hegel and beyond Marx. He does agree with Marx uh, that uh, uh, we have to find uh, some critical analysis which is rooted in our sensuous experiences, and somehow we have to relate the problems of our consciousness to our sensuous experiences, right? In this respect, Freud is very much in the line of Marx's critique of Hegel. This is not simply radicalizing your consciousness. You have to confront your consciousness with your sensuous experiences. But he's different from Marx, because I pointed this out earlier very briefly, because in Marx, this sensuous activity is production. It is economic activity. For Freud, it is our sexual experiences, right? And he offers a criticism of our consciousness by confronting us with our repressed se sexual experiences in our earlier life, right? So this is a critical theory, right? He said, what you think is in your mind is right. No, 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 it isn't, right? You have to think about 
all of your experiences of your earlier sexual life, and then when you figure out what you repressed as bad memories, that's when you will actually will be able to have a healthier psychic life, right? Well, uh, uh, Weber is more complicated, and we will come back to this <coughs> Weber's critical theory when we get to Weber and, and to the question whether he's a critical theorist at all. That has been highly debated. Okay, I think now we are ready for Friedrich Nietzsche, and I hope this makes more sense now for you, right? What you were, were, were reading, right? Right? And let me just emphasize one more time, right? The big project in uh, Nietzsche is to offer a critical scrutiny of human mind, but not to have any critical vantage point, right? To criticize the very principles of good society and good to critical scrutiny. Where does it come from? Then we have the conception um, of good, right? And good society. That is his project. It's an incredible intellectual venture, right? As I said, it is this kind of squaring of the circle, what he does, but he does uh, with a great deal of power. And he does it extremely provocatively. I will put up a couple of quotations for it, which are outrageous. Don't walk out on it, right? Wait a little. Hold your breath. Listen. Uh, this is outrageous what he's saying. He's a provocateur. Um, he is like Rousseau. He is only worse than Rousseau, right? He provokes us even more than Rousseau. Uh, but, you know, deep down, he is a very sensitive, you know, very humanistic human being, right? He provokes you, but if you listen carefully, you figure out there is uh, something but you actually can relate to it when you think what he's actually is trying to get at. All right, here is uh, Nietzsche, and let me just very briefly rush through his life. He was born in 1844 in the small city of Röcken uh, in Germany near Leipzig. And this is very important. His father was a Lutheran minister, and the family was all clergy, Lutheran clergy. And he's bringing up a very, in a very religious uh, uh, sentiments, a uh, uh, very religious family. And in many ways, uh, his work is a reaction against the father, and it is a reaction against the kind of uh, Lutheran Christianity he was deeply uh, internalized into. I think this is very important to understand. I mean, I, <coughs> I know that most of the people in this room uh, have strong feelings of in Judeo-Christian tradition, and he attacks also Judeo-Christian tradition. This is a revolt against the father. This is a revolt against what he was brought up to. It is an attempt to find himself, right? That's what he's trying to get at, and you have to be a little tolerant about him, you know, and his attempt, you did that as well. You were revolting against your parents, and you were revolting against uh, uh, some of the uh, fundamental principles you were born into. He actually enrolls uh, to the University of Braun to become a, a, a Lutheran minister himself. He studies theology. As it happens to many people, actually, who enroll into a seminary, doesn't take him too long to become an atheist. Uh, very often, you know, the uh, uh, s seminaries are the best training grounds for atheists, right? You, you're beginning to see somehow the complexity of theological thought. This is what he experienced. So he quits after a year. He, rea he realizes he's on his way to become an atheist, right? And he will not become um, um, a, um, um, a minister. Actually, this happened to my, my brother as well. Uh, he actually did not quit. He did finish. Uh, uh, and he, he was also a, uh, trained as a Lutheran minister. But by the end uh, uh, of his theological uh, training, he was, I, he, I don't think he ever confessed, but he was actually an atheist. So I, I have personal experiences, right? What theology can do to you, right? Uh, uh, okay, uh, then 68, there is a very important event in his life. Uh, he meets uh, the greatest composers of his time, Richard Wagner, and they become 
great friends for a time and they become bitter enemies later on and this is very important why this happened. Uh, he is appointed as professor of classical philosophy at the University of Basel before he got actually his degree but he doesn't do it for too long, right? He is only uh, teaching for eight years uh, uh, in his life and, and then he um, uh, retreats uh, and he sacrifices his life to scholarly activity, spends a lot of time in Italy and if it, he's in Switzerland in a, in a small beautiful spot, Sils Maria. Uh, he also meets uh, in 73 Paul Ray, um, a German philosopher who has a great deal of impact on him, who introduces him in 82 to Lou Salome, uh, his uh, only real but very passionate lover, and I will uh, say a few words about this later on. In 88, he becomes mentally ill. The story of his men uh, beginning of his mental illness tells you a lot about him. Uh, he is in Genoa, uh, in Italy, and then on, he walks on the streets, uh, and then he saw a carriage driver beating the horse uh, uh, vengefully. And then he suddenly uh, cuddles the horse, uh, beginning to cry, and his mind is gone, right? He falls deeply um, into mental illness. He never recovers anymore. That's, I think, tells a lot about who Nietzsche as a human being was, right? And how actually, uh, how, how much compassion he could have with suffering, right? Uh, this work, what you were reading, has a lot to do with suffering and gives you uh, a devastating view what human suffering uh, means. Anyway, he is in uh, his care of his mother until she dies, and then uh, um, his care, unfortunately for him, to his sister Elizabeth. Um, uh, uh, and uh, he dies in his home in 1900. Now a bit about uh, um, Elizabeth Nietzsche. Uh, here she is. Uh, she was born two years after um, uh, 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 Nietzsche. Um, uh, and uh, he married a guy whose name was Bernard Furster in 1885. And Furster was uh, one of these proto-Nazis. Uh, he was a fanatic uh, anti-Semite. Uh, he was very attracted to this idea of the superior Aryan race. And he actually created an Aryan colony in Paraguay and moved with Elizabeth to Paraguay in a pure German community. Uh, some remains still exist. And you know, if you are a devoted neo-Nazi, you may want to visit Paraguay because there are some of these guys here still hanging out there. They look like Indians because, of course, that's very pure uh, Aryan nation. They are not blonde and uh, uh, blue eyes any longer. I, they intermarried with the locals, right? But anyway, this is what he wanted to do. It didn't work very well, so at one point uh, he committed suicide and Elizabeth uh, uh, returned uh, to Germany. Uh, well, I think it's very important that Nietzsche, after uh, she got married, broke the relationship with his sister. He just could not stand uh, his uh, brother-in-law and his anti-Semitism. Uh, you will see some of the citations which sound very anti-Semitic. He was very intolerant about anti-Semites. Uh, uh, this was one of the reasons why he broke his relationship with Richard Wagner. Um, but in 94, uh, Elizabeth created the Nietzsche archive. Uh, Nietzsche was insane, um, and uh, he had a lot of unpublished work, manuscripts. He put it together into an archives, and he abused it as much as she could. Uh, she turned into a, a right-winger and uh, with the rise of Nazism, a Nazi, an admirer of Hitler, and he put together a lot of uh, um, um, Nietzsche test uh, in order to fabricate a Nazi ideology out of Nietzsche, Nietzsche. And some therefore have been reading for a very long time Nietzsche as an ideologue of Nazism. So did Adolf Hitler, who actually even attended the funeral of Elizabeth in 1935 when she died. Well, I think uh, uh, people who read uh, Nietzsche carefully and who have seen now Nietzsche's uh, original um, uh, um, work published rather than selections by Elizabeth 
uh, have a great deal of doubt whether Nietzsche has anything to do with Nazism, though the story is complicated. Now, uh, here we come, a nice triangle. Lou, Salome, Paul Ray, and Friedrich Nietzsche. Well, I should show this picture after Freud. Uh, remember that? <laughs> uh, watch, watch on it. It is a very Freudian kind of presentation. Louis Salome, Paul Rue in the middle, and Friedrich Nietzsche uh, uh, and, uh, on the other side of the picture. Now, uh, Lou, Paul, and Friedrich. Uh, uh, Paul Ray is actually comes from a very wealthy Jewish family, German Jewish family, uh, for reasons which is beyond me. Occasionally, um, uh, Nietzsche refers to him when they already broke up uh, uh, as a, a, the, the English uh, psychologist. He was a German philosopher. Um, anyway, he, he became very, very good friends uh, uh, at one point. Uh, I mean, you know, Nietzsche was an impossible person. He fell in love with people and then he broke. Just strong love or strong, or strong hatred. There was nothing in between. Um, but anyway, the idea of genealogy, which is probably the main piece uh, in Nietzsche's work, is coming from Paul Ray. Then he introduced this wonderful young and very smart young lady, Lou Salome, to Nietzsche, and he was desperately in love uh, with him. This happened in 82. She was 21 year, years old. Uh, as I said, very beautiful and wonderfully smart. Uh, um, and uh, well, uh, Nietzsche uh, was hoping to marry her. I mean, he uh, was opposed to the idea of marriage, but uh, you know, he's writing letters to Paul Ray, kind of not aware that uh, there is a relationship going on between Paul Ray and Lou, uh, that he wants to marry her probably for two years or something. And uh, anyway, um, uh, I think uh, by all likelihood uh, there is an interesting love triangle going on here for a while, but Nietzsche is impossible, and Lou is a sane woman, and at one point she just cannot uh, take her his insanity anymore, and he moves uh, to Berlin, lives for a while with Paul Ray, and then though he is also opposed to marriage, you know, we are talking late 19th century, right? Very radical ideas about sexuality and marriage. But then he still married uh, this guy, linguist called Andreas. Anyway, she was also a very smart woman. She at one point said they wrote a book together, Re Nietzsche and Herself, and she never published that. Uh, she said this was an experiment, a joint book <coughs> by the three. We never, you know, I, as far as I know, it never had. Uh, another important person in his life, uh, Richard Wagner. Uh, well, uh, uh, Nietzsche was a music fanatic in, 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 in already in his boyhood, and when he read uh, uh, Wagner's piano transcript of Tristan and Isolde, uh, he just fell in love with that. That was the music he was looking for. Um, he, why? He was he was a hero worshipper. Uh, that's why, you know, people, some people read still in him a kind of proto-Nazis. He, he likes strong, beautiful people who are heroic and do act, do heroic act. Uh, like the Greek, uh, right? Uh, 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 beautiful, young man, powerful, right? And heroic, like the gods, the Greek gods. That's what he uh, really um, uh, empired. And this is what he found in Wagner's music, yeah, a rejection of the Rus uh, Ros Rossini kind of sentimentalism of Italian music. And in fact, the classicism and coldness uh, um, um, and pretentiousness uh, uh, in the music of, uh, of Beethoven. And what he found uh, um, is something uh, new in Wagner. So he was attracted to Wagner um, and uh, um, as he was becoming uh, uh, actually increasingly anti-Semitic, uh, uh, under the influence of his uh, 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 last wife, Cosima, who was the daughter of Franz Liszt, the composer, and, and was r really a pretty evil person. Um, uh, and also, Wagner was changing. He was uh, becoming, in, in some ways, mo kind of more Christian or something. And he was writing this, I actually have to confess, love the opera, Parsifal. <laughs> Nietzsche could not take it, you know, it was uh, impossible for him. So then they break 
uh, he could not stand Wagner's anti-Semitism, and he could not stand Parsifal, and the kind of expression of, uh, I don't know, anybody ever uh, heard Parsifal? No. Uh, not an easy stuff. Um, it uh, it's uh, sounds like an oratorium. Uh, uh, it has some Bachian kind of elements in it. Um, uh, and uh, it's about uh, 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 the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus' sacrifice and uh, 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 performance of the Mass uh, and the cult uh, uh, of uh, 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 Jesus' blood uh, uh, as such. I, I mean, uh, anyway, this was certainly, uh, Nietzsche was not uh, a buyer for it. Well, uh, just a word about uh, his first book, uh, The Birth of the Tragedy, uh, which, uh, um, uh, as I said, he was a great admirer of the Greek civilization. Um, and if he, uh, here, he, uh, he, his idea is that the whole human history is driven by the struggle between a Dionysian and Apollonian principle. Dionysian means, right? your sentiments, right? You, uh, you act out of your instincts, and Apollonian means uh, the reason as such. And, uh, you know, uh, the book uh, contrasts enlightenment. Enlightenment is reason. It's a, a victory of Apollonian principle over the D Dionysian principle. And he kind of rejected, this is why he's also kind of postmodern, right? He, re he rejects enlightenment, and enlightenment, excessive rationalism. And this is why actually he liked Wagner, because he thought in Wagner uh, the uh, Dionysian and the Apollonian components are being combined, right? Uh, passion and reason are put together, um, uh, and Wagner loved the book. Then uh, he writes the book, uh, 1879, 1879 uh, Human Ode to Human, which starts uh, uh, from Voltaire and the sort of uh, reification of the free thinkers. Now, he is a free thinker, uh, and he also breaks with romanticism um, um, and uh, uh, follows Ray, and he said, well, what we have to do is to subject the Christian idea of good and evil to critical scrutiny, and not to accept that there is some general principle of good, and therefore he tries to uh, develop the genealogy of morals. Now, as you can see, Wagner and Nietzsche are on collision course, right? Uh, Nietzsche is now subjecting the very core of Judeo-Christian tradition to critical scrutiny, uh, while uh, 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 Wagner is writing Parsifal and uh, being uh, 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 the Holy Grail and the skepticism. Uh, Wagner assumedly even has not read the book. Uh, he, uh, he heard about it and rejected it. He did not buy anything about this. Now this is Nietzsche's house in uh, uh, Sils Maria. He went there for uh, the first time in 81, fell in love with this and spent time there until he became uh, ill. He also wrote the genealogy of morals. He wrote to his, his mother, finally I found the loveliest spot on earth. Uh, and um, he uh, was greatly inspired. This is where he wrote the book, also spoke uh, uh, Zarathustra, Da spoke Zarathustra. Um, uh, this is a kind of a book which is a central attack on Ju Judeo-Christian morality, but he found repressive and wants to get out of it. Uh, his hero is Zarathustra, which is modeled after the Persian prophet Zoroaster, and he calls him the, the first of immoralist. To dare to be immoral is what you have to do. But he, and he tries to find a middle way, right, between the repressive Judeo-Christian morality and nihilism. He, he wants to get, uh, uh, doesn't want to reject everything. Uh, and that's where he beginning to develop the idea of the Übermensch. Uh, I wish we would have more time to talk about this. Uh, um, uh, the Übermensch is basically the person who brings his life under his own control. It's not quite what you think the Übermensch is, right? The stereotypes about the Übermensch, that this was the kind of Nazi idea of the blonde Germans, right, which are superhuman. Well, Nietzsche has a philosophical notion of the Übermensch. The Übermensch is the person who achieves self-mastery, who, 
basically the alienated person, right, who is in control of his own life, right, and can express himself uh, authentically without oppressive civilization, right? That's, that's the Übermensch. In a way, this is a Buddha. It is an idea of a Buddha, but not a passive Buddha. He disliked Buddhism as much as he li disliked the Judeo-Christian tradition. The, the problem with the Buddhism was that it is too passive. He, he wanted to have an active Buddhism, right? Somebody who becomes a master of its life through action, acting out its feelings and its uh, 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 even uh, uh, sensual uh, uh, essence uh, in, in, in life. Uh, um, uh, and therefore, he, c he can overcome what he calls the eternal return, right? Uh, he o can overcome the iron law of this, uh, you know, this is again comes from almost Marx, right? Reified consciousness. The reified word can be broken. There are no rules, right? You can, uh, you can realize yourself in the world, and you are not ruled by the external world. And now he's ready for the genealogy of morals. I have <coughs> some 12 minutes for this. What are the major contributions? Well, he reconstructs the, te the, the methodology of genealogy, what he uh, takes from Ray, and, uh, uh, and he discovers what he calls the origins of morality. Uh, and then he introduces a difference. Okay, what is the difference between good and bad, where this is coming from, and good and evil, where this is coming from. And he compares the two ways how this dichotomy that some behavior is good, other is bad, some behavior is good, other is evil, where this is coming from, and this is the essence of the genealogical method, right? He does not need a critical vantage point. The good and evil distinction can be criticized from the good, bad distinction point of view, and the good, uh, and, and vice versa, you see? Uh, but this is the essence of genealogical method. Um, as uh, Foucault will interpret it, Give me a notion, tell me what is right, right? And what I do, I take the same conception back in history, and then we'll show what you think is right, just, or noble, has been at one point of time regarded as evil, what you should fight for. And tell me what you think is evil, and I go back in history, and I will show you instances where what you think is evil was actually admired and was seen as ethical, right? This is the essence, right, of the genealogical method, right? That you compare two ways how morality is being constructed, and you are criticized one from the point of view of the other without taking sides where do actually you stand uh, uh, as such. And then he develops, you know, the kind of origins of the, the notion of evil out of slave morality and ressentiment. And then comes one of the most controversial issue, the idea of the blonde beast, <laughs> the bird of prey, um, and the origins of ideals, uh, uh, what can be easily, I think, again, I will have to ask for your patience. Uh, uh, and then the idea of Übermensch, uh, and finally the origins of punishment, uh, and uh, bad consciousness and guilt. Okay, so as I said, he reconstructs the genealogical method, he, uh, I think it's a wonderful sentence how the whole book begins. We are unknown to ourselves. We know us, um, and with good reason. We have never looked at ourselves, right? This is critical uh, theory, what he suggests, right? You think you know a lot of stuff about, you know, Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and now Nietzsche, but you don't look at yourself. Look at yourself. Be critical of your own consciousness. And especially the major step here, try to subject the very conceptions what you think is ethical to critical scrutiny is, where does this idea come from? Uh, 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 and he said his real uh, argument is that the origins of the term good and evil, good uh, and do, have, we have to discover how it actually was constructed and not with a, a, a more superior principle. So therefore, what we need is a critique of moral values. This is wonderful now. The value of these values should be subjected to critical scrutiny itself, right? 
And not only the values, but the values behind the values. You know, there is an unending criticism um, uh, 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 in, in the process. So this way, what Nietzsche can do, or he believes he can do, uh, is to offer a critical analysis without some ultimate value. He does not give you ultimate values, but is the right value is. But he does that without becoming nihilistic and to say anything goes. Not. We can discover the miseries of the world. We can be upset. He could so be uh, so upset to cattle this horse, which is beaten, right? You can have compassion, uh, and he uh, uh, said he should. This was an inspiration for Foucault. All right, the differences in the origins of good and bad um, and good and evil. Well, I think this is a, a pretty, uh, probably the most straightforward part in the text, what you have read. Yes, he said, well, when we use the word good, you often, often see that good has something to do with uh, being not egoistic. He said, well, that's not so. It has nothing to do with non-egoistic in terms of its origin. It was constructed as non-egoistic later on. And he said, where does the good coming from? It is coming from a master race. A master race which saw itself uh, as good and uh, defined those who were subjected to its rule, uh, usually dark-stained, uh, natives, uh, as bad. Um, uh, uh, that is where the notion of uh, good and bad is coming from. Um, but that's different with priests. Uh, uh, you know, he was studying to become a minister, and he really disliked priests priests, you know, wearing these dark clothes, you know, they are not the chivalric aristocratic kind like the Greek uh, semi-gods and gods, right, uh, who are confident in themselves. And uh, uh, therefore, the, uh, the chivalric and aristocratic distinction, right, which was right, the physically good, you know, uh, uh, the, the beautiful body, the uh, man and women uh, of, of, of Greek antiquity, um, uh, uh, could see themselves as good, and others who were not as good, as crippled, they were bad. Now, uh, uh, the priests are powerless, uh, and this powerlessness uh, leads to hatred. Hatred of those who have power, right? And now those who have power are seen by the powerless as evil, not simply as bad, but as evil. So now the contrast is not between good and bad, uh, but between good and evil. But the turn that around uh, is uh, the power relationship. And now comes the slave morality. And, well, he said it was the Jews. That was the priestly nation, the nation of priests. Um, and the origins of Christianity uh, brought about uh, this reversal, saying only those who suffer are good, only poor, the powerless, are good, right? The rich and those in power are evil, right? Um, and uh, the slave revolt of morality, he said, begins with the Jewish revolt. Uh, it, and this has a, a thousand years of history. And you know what? That was victorious. This is the dominant morality of our times. And he said this uh, leads to the, and, and, and here you can see this is not an anti-Semitic statement. This is a criticism of the Judeo-Christian morality. And in fact, the real target is Christian morality. That's why he said this is the horrible paradox of God on cross, right? Uh, that, that is, you know, when, when you sort of turn, right, uh, those without sin to carry the sin of, of humankind, the self crucifixion of God for the salvation of mankind, right? And this is a, this ressentiment, uh, ressentiment, there is no proper English or German word for it, right? Uh, uh, now beginning to see the enemy, not simply as bad as, you know, I don't care, it is bad, I defeat it, but it is evil, it may even defeat me. And now comes the blonde beast, another provocative kind of statement. The center of all noble races, one cannot fail to see the beast of prey, the magnificent blonde beast, uh, right? Uh, avidly prowling around to spoil and victory, right? As I said, hero worship. But let's, uh, you know, 
uh, is this the German blonde? He says, well, Europe viewed with horror the raging of the blood Germanic beast for centuries. But then he adds, watch carefully, right? Although between the old Germanic people and us Germans, there is scarcely an idea in common, let alone blood relationship, right? This is not Nazi ideology, right? This is a kind of uh, argument that being powerful, be, uh, being realizing yourself is, uh, uh, is actually what is desirable, what you should be striving for. Uh, well, I think uh, this is very important, right, this, uh, this last uh, sentence I'm quoting here. Uh, right, what's happening in European situation is a kind of a leveling, right? Today we see nothing but wants to expand. Uh, we are getting thinner, right? We are not as strong as the statues in Greek statues were, right? And be better natured, right? Cleverer and more comfortable, right? And more mediocre. And he said, better, better, it smells, what a horrible modernity, right? That we become all mediocre and all the same, and we cannot fulfill ourselves, right? And then, well, this is a, a very nice poetry, provocative, but, you know, think about it. There is nothing strange about the fact that the lambs bear a grudge towards the large birds of prey. But there is no reason to blame the large birds of prey for carrying the little lamb. They have the lambs say to each other, these birds of prey are evil. And whoever is least like the bird of prey, and most like the opposite, like us, the lamb, is good, isn't it? Right? Those who dominate is bad, and those we are the suffering are the good ones. The, the, <laughs> yeah, the bird of prey responds. We don't bear any grudge at all towards those good lambs. In fact, we love them, right? Nothing can taste better than a tender lamb, right? Well, as I said, this is disturbing, but I think the point is what he is calling for, right? The self-fulfillment of individual and, the, and his um, desperation that in modern world we cannot fulfill ourselves. And here comes the workshop ideals are where uh, the ideals are fabricated. He said, in this workshop, lies are turning weakness into accomplishment, Impo impotence, uh, 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 not to retaliate, is being turned into goodness, though you are only in impotent, and you beginning to construct your impotence as good. You are not good. You can't do anything about it. And submission to people that you hate, that's what you call obedience. Um, not because they, you really accept their superiority, because you are afraid of them. And then you construct a good notion out of this. Obedience, this is a good word. Um, well, he said, there are, they are also talking, love your enemy. Um, and they are sweat by the saying so, right? It's a big lie. You don't love your enemy. You hate the guts out of them. You say you love them, and meanwhile you sweat, right? That's what he said, you know. This is the workshop, right, in which uh, 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 the ideals are uh, 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 created. This is where they call it the triumph of justice. Uh, you don't hate your enemy. Oh, no, no, no. You hate injustice, right? you create your enemy as unjust, right, and unfair. I rather think, well, this is my enemy, and he's stronger than me. Um, well, therefore, he said, the workshops where ideals are fabricated, they stink of lies, and they give better, better, get out of here, clean air, let's talk truth, not lies. That's the point. And Übermensch is the one which will, right? Because the Übermensch is, uh, he said, well, uh, good and bad, good and evil, put together now, the good and evil is uh, dominating us. Uh, the other Renaissance was brilliant. It was reconstructing, right, the, our classical idea 
Uh, but then came, again you said, the Judah triumphant game. Again, be careful, not anti-Semitic, no. It's again more <laughs> against Luther than against Jews. He said, thanks to the basically proletarian German and English ressentiment movement called the Reformation, right? That's his real enemy here. And he said, well, the, uh, my, uh, not, I don't have time to labor on this. So uh, very briefly, origins of punishment. Uh, well, uh, we have to forget. Uh, forget is we have to su suppress uh, memories which were bad. And in order to suppress, uh, well, uh, there is uh, a mem mnemotechnics. Uh, that means that we are actually, pain is the most uh, uh, useful way how we forget what we have to forget, we, we have to remember, right? Um, he said, these Germans, the nation of thinker, made a memory for themselves with dreadful methods, uh, stoning, breaking on wheels, ripping apart, and tramping to death by horses. All right, I have to finish it now here. Uh, but I hope you get sort of the bottom line, right? The bottom line is have a radical critical theory which does not need ultimate value to be critical of uh, false ideas and lies. Get shoes, and the ideal is the person who can fulfill itself uh, right in the world and conquer the world as such.